Hey, welcome back to Couch to Crit, where I bring a cyclist from Couch Fitness to Criterium Success. I am back with my buddy Logan. Welcome back, Logan. What's going on, Jeff? Good, man. Thanks for staying awake tonight. It's a little bit later than we usually record, so thanks for hanging in there. I'm happy to. It's worth it. It's worth it because we're talking equipment today, and I am very excited. I'm going to get worked up about equipment. Um, I know you guys like equipment, too, and um, the way I want to approach this, because it's a big topic, is I am going to go back 12 years or so when I first got into the sport, and I want to just go through all of my equipment choices. Some of them were good. Some of them were comically bad, <laughs> and, uh, and I want to talk about like the decisions I made, why I made them, and what I recommend for you guys, because let's be honest, this is, a, this is an expensive sport, and I want you guys to you know, spend your hard-earned money in a, in a smart and sensible way. Uh, how does that sound? We're not going to talk about how you started out on a $12,000 bike in Cat 2. <laughs> Believe it or not, I did not. <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> very far from how things actually worked out. Um, but speaking of equipment, you got a couple of goodies in the mail this week. You want to you wanna tell the fans what you got? Yeah, yeah. I got a um, Feedback Sports sent a little care package. There it is right me there. Up with some, uh, some great tools. It's made getting the bike on and off the trainer so much easier so this past week. Yeah, for sure. And I recommend everybody. By the way, Performance Bike was was um, gracious enough to send that out to Logan. Uh, and um, I recommend everybody have like a kit. I didn't have one when I first started. And I know you guys are doing a lot of your maintenance um, in like the kitchen, in the living room. Like we've all been there. And do yourself a favor and just get a simple kit. They have a lot of really great options. Feedback Sports is a good one. Um, and, uh, and also performance bike sells park tools, really high end stuff. Um, that's where I got my tools. Uh, go check them out and, um, and get yourself a kit. You'll thank me. I, I, I promise. And then what, what was the other thing that you got, which I'm really excited about? Yeah. So the reason I had to get the bike on and off the trainer so much was because I had to take it to the bike shop to get the power meter fitted. So the power meter came in. Power meter I'm landed guys. Go. Super excited. It's on the bike. Yeah. Dual sided stages. Um, what is it? Is it, what did you get? Ultegra? Do you know the, yes. um, Ultegra? Yeah. Um, which is, which is awesome. Cause I didn't think they were in stock. They must be the only vendor that has <laughs> power meters in stock these <laughs> days. It's a big issue. So, um, so speaking of that, we are going to, we're going to get you outside and I want to establish, uh, your power curve. And we talked a little bit about this in something I'm losing track now in one of the episodes or one of the live streams, we do live streams on Saturdays if you, in case you guys don't know, but, um, yeah. a power curve. So, Let's just touch on that really fast because I want to get into the equipment. It was Power Curve with Jonathan when we talked with Trainer Road. That's right. That's right. That was yep. episode two. Because he asked me what I thought I would be, and I was like, oh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, we're going to find out pretty soon. Um, yeah. It's it's a pretty grueling day. Um, it's a lot of work, but the way you do it is you, uh, you go out um, with the power meter, obviously, now that you have that on your bike, and you do uh, four tests. You do a 20-minute, you do a five-minute, you do a one-minute, and then you do an all-out sprint. And you do maximum efforts for each one. And what that does, I'll put mine up on the screen right now, is, um, is you get this, uh, this curve, power curve, and it's your maximum power on uh, the y-axis, and it's your, um, the, the time is on the x-axis. So if you, you usually see it weighted all the way um, to the left, like you guys do right now, and that's because obviously you can do more power for a shorter amount of time. But you can take that information, and it drives uh, training goals, right? If you have it, if, if it really thins out off to the right, you know that you need to work on longer efforts and, um, and vice versa. So it drives training. It drives, uh, your strategy when it comes to racing. And, um, there's a lot of good information from that. And it kind of tells like where you're at. It's a snapshot in time. It doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be a sprinter. For example, um, you can change things, but it, it tells you where you're at in a snapshot in time. And for Logan, who's just getting started out, it's a great, it's a great tool. So, um, we're going to have that information for you guys, hopefully in the next episode. And, uh, Four efforts in one day. How do you feel about that, Logan? So I'm excited for it because I haven't done it yet. But I can guarantee you after doing it once or twice, it's going to be, you know, dreading, they're, dreading it. They're brutal. In that Zwift video, I made a, a video about Zwift racing. Um, I, uh, I did a power. I did two of them, one inside and one outside to tell the difference. And um, oof. <laughs> they're rough but um how much difference was the longer distance stuff on the trainer well, wasn't that wasn't no that it wasn't that big yeah you guys can check out that video for for full details um you really only see a difference when you're on a trainer a stationary fixed trainer on the really short um efforts but uh gotcha but yeah let's um without further ado um should we talk actually i take that back we're going to talk about your um you're going to do a, we're going to touch on your training really fast um okay, because yeah. there's been some developments there too 
Excited to report your training's yeah. been going really well. You um, haven't missed any workouts. You've completed all the ones that you've attempted. In fact, they felt pretty, I dare say, easy. How, how, do, how do you feel? I don't want to say easy, but I say, <laughs> I want to say easy. You know, like toward the end, I'm feeling like this should be harder. You know, so yeah. I've, been, I've been bumping the, the percentage up toward the end of workouts and we talked and that should probably be more for the whole workout, but it's been going up about 10%. Um, not sure. Yeah. So, so let me, let me paint that picture really fast. So what's going on is, um, is Logan's is he's couch to crit. That's the, this video series, right? So he's coming off the couch. It doesn't have, um, any structured endurance workout, uh, training. And he is, uh, seeing big gains early on. And that's why these workouts are feeling much easier. Because when he first started, he did a ramp test. And that sets this benchmark for all of your future workouts. The way Trainer Road works is it takes your ramp test and then it, it builds your workout plan based on the results of that ramp test. Okay, so Logan has already exceeded all of his previous uh, ramp test results. And that's why the workouts are starting to feel easy. And this is great news, by the way. This means that you're improving. And congrats on like sticking with the, the structure because consistency and structure is how you get faster. It's like, this is no surprise, but it's, it's good to see it in action. So um, there's two ways that you can go about fixing this um, because you want the workout still to count. One way is what Logan has been doing. And that is if you feel like you want, they're a little bit easier than they should be. You can bump it up in the bottom left-hand corner in the app. You can press the little plus button and it'll increase in single percentage increments until you feel like it's, it's at that point where it's like, oh, I can barely finish it. That's kind of the way it should feel. Um, the other thing you can do is a mid block retest. So if you really want it to be like very structured and you're willing to, um, uh, to swap out a workout for a, a ramp test, for example, you can go, um, mid, in, you can go mid block and you can retest. And then, uh, that will kind of, kind of reset those workouts moving forward. So, uh, we've decided to bump up the percentage points and, um, we're going to retest in, uh, in a few weeks and we're going to do that, uh, on the live stream. I'm a little bit, a little bit nervous Suffer about doing that in front of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be, it's going to be a pretty, pretty funny live stream because we're going to be, um, dying a thousand deaths for you guys. So, um, wow, that was a long intro, but all relevant info, but I do want to get to equipment now. How do you guys feel about that? Time for bikes. Time for bikes. Let's do it. Okay, guys, so the way I want to do this is I want to take Logan here on a trip with me down memory lane back about 12 years ago, and I want to go back through all of these equipment choices I've made over the years, about 12 years worth, and I want to uh, point out the equipment changes I made, and I want to tell you if this was a good decision, a bad decision, or somewhere in the middle, and I think you guys are going to get, find some enjoyment in this, so, so, let, so let's back, start here. We're going back 12 years. How old is baby Jeff here? <laughs> um, 22, 23, right in there. We're going to date you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 30. I'm race age 35. It's funny that I'm about to age myself as my race age, <laughs> but uh, I'm 34 <laughs> race age 35. So I'm probably 22 here. And uh, there I am <laughs> with mismatched everything. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Baggy. Those glasses styling. Oh yeah. Oh, to I was a rock and roll back then, man. And look <laughs> at that Fuji. So let's talk about the bike here. This is like a $600 Fuji Roubaix comp or something like that. So whenever I whenever I had come into the sport and was trying to get into the sport, I, I, I assumed that you like at the minimum you needed like the thousand dollar entry level aluminum bike, and then as soon as time or debt allowed, you got a carbon bike. So, <laughs> Mister Cat Two over here didn't start out in Cat Two or on a carbon bike. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I started on this hunk of junk, and um, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Like, in no. fact, this bike got me to Cat Two. Like, I raced the the bejesus out of this bike i raced it down to, to nothing um i here let's go to the next photo here i am at the top of mount tam <laughs> whatever just some old photos it's the same bike i'm surprised i was able to lift that thing it was probably weighed 47 pounds or something like that um, <laughs> but i got the job done and and um and here we go this is uh this broken is probably chain. this is broken chain we're gonna talk about that in a second but um, the reason I selected this photo is uh, is we have new wheels. These are my these are my race wheels, which I which I thought is funny looking back now. It's just another set of alum of aluminum, you know, alloy wheels. But uh, I think the intent was good here. I think it, it is important, even if it's two aluminum wheels, um, to have a set of training wheels and a set of race wheels. One that is like ready to go. In my case, the, my high performance tire was a GP four thousand GP four season actually, not even a four thousand, which is by no means a, a performance tire, but uh. I did not take care of my equipment <laughs> as, <laughs> as obviously shown in this picture. Um, 
so yeah, that was kind of, th- that was kind of one of my big, uh, flaws early on is like, you got to take care of your stuff. I broke a chain in a race just cause I didn't take care of it. Like, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. So that was, uh, let's see, that was 2010. I had that bike. And once I got to cat two, I rewarded myself and I got this felt. This is a uh, felt F4. And this is in 2011, I think. Is that's what I said? Yeah, 2011, Felt F4 I bought. And you're going to notice something else, too. I'm, I'm actually wearing a team jersey now. <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention one thing, because I know that you guys are going to hate me. So I'm going to go back to that last photo. Um, I just want to know if you guys can ever forgive me for wearing ankle socks in a bike race. Oh, I didn't even see that. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. You started hating on me in the live stream for wearing <laughs> ankle socks. I know. And then I saw this photo. I was like, I got to use this photo. And I thought Man. I could, yeah, I should have just snuck that one past you, Logan, but, um, Dang it. forgive me, please guys don't unsubscribe over the, uh, the ankle <laughs> socks, please. <laughs> um, so here we go. Uh, web core. I was in just on the club at first. This is a big local club and I was riding a wave of success in 2011. Um, I catted up, uh, in over the course of a year from, from five to two. And, um, I was really getting the hang of the sport. Yeah. I treated myself. So you're going to see the, the Williams, uh, Split. wheels, on the felt bike here, I'm all I'm all greened out here in the webcore green, and I'll tell you something about the equipment here. the The two uh, wheels that I had, the the training wheels and the alloy race wheels, not a huge difference. Um, these were just better kept and had um, some slightly better tires on them. But I'll I'll tell you one thing: going from a uh, a really really low end aluminum bike to like a kind of a mid tier felt F4 full carbon actual like race geometry bike. That was a pretty significant difference. You can tell right away it's lighter, it's it's much stiffer, but it's stiffer in the right direction. Aluminum bikes are just stiff all over. They're just like a, extremely stiff, which which is usually fine in a criterium. Carbon bikes are stiff in the direction, the business direction, backwards and forwards. So power delivery is really good, but they're um, more compliant up and down. So they're more comfortable. For those of you wondering or, or contemplating pulling the trigger, that's the benefit of a carbon frame. So here you go. Next year. 2012. What are we looking at here? Some big equipment differences. Same jersey, slightly updated, less green, a little bit more blue. Um, this was uh, after my, my breakout year, um, I was asked to join the, um, the Webcore Elite team. One of the benefits of being on the Webcore Elite team is a uh, team bike. So we had this Focus is Zalco Max Pro something or other. I can't, I can't remember the specific name of it. It was, it, it was a carbon race bike. I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say. It was, it was great. It lasted me the whole year. Um, I also got these um, Easton wheels. I, I, what's your perception, Logan, coming into the sport? Like, have you ever ridden carbon wheels? No, I have not ridden ridden a carbon bike. I have not ridden carbon wheels. I don't know what I'm missing. And at this point, I'm afraid to learn. <laughs> and at this point, I'm too afraid to ask. Uh, it's um, you'll fi- you'll find a significant difference, like I said, in the carbon bike. The carbon wheels, you might feel a difference. It's not night and day like the frame. Uh, the bike will be lighter. The bike will be faster. Mm-hmm. Um, you might feel it be, be more snappy and more responsive. But at, at a My certain point, you're kind of splitting bike feels light for any those. bike I've ever had. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> it's all relative, right? Um, yeah, I have this a carbon was, fork. There you go. <laughs> carbon forks for the win. This this setup was great. I mean, this was way more than I needed. Uh, my second year, or I guess it was, I guess it was technically my, my third year in racing, th- uh, my second full year in racing. But I kind of hit a roadblock. I learned a lot that year. But learning a lot usually means you make a bunch of mistakes. And um, that's kind of how that year went for me. Um, I thought I was king of the world when I was smashing through the Cat 5s and Cat 4s and Cat 3s. And then it was like, whoa, pump the brakes, Jeff. P12 is a, is a completely different animal. You actually have to race with intention and with strategy. So I learned the hard way. Guys, there's a reason I have like all of these strategy ideas um, that I share on the channel. It's because I spent uh, over 10 years doing it the wrong way and learning what works and what doesn't. So um, anyway, uh, let's get through these photos. Same setup, same year, um, just a different race. Pretty aggressive position. I think I've always kind of adopted that. I still have, that focus must've been really aggressive. I still have some some stack height there uh, on the uh, steer. So I don't know, what, what am I doing at the front of the race here? I don't know, guys. I'm probably making a mistake right here. <laughs> You're chasing a teammate, probably. <laughs> no, I wouldn't <laughs> do such a thing. Let's see here. Yeah, uh, Learning experience that year. This is probably me. Hopefully, it's me off the front. This might be me off the back. I don't. I don't know. No gloves. I don't practice as I preach. Apparently, following year, um, where are we at now? 2013. Joined a team with uh, some close friends out in Folsom, and look, we're back on the felt. I was off the Webcore Elite team. In fact, everybody was. That team folded. So that's why I joined this team out of Folsom. Was able to hang on to the the Easton 
carbon wheels. I'll tell you one thing. These were tubulars. I don't know if I mentioned that before. These Eastons are tubulars, which are a tremendous pain. Like, there's a reason you see all of the, uh, you know, World Tour teams seeming to be getting away from uh, the tubulars because, for those of you who don't know, it is actually glued onto the rim. The rim, the tire glue, glues onto the rim, and the tube is inside of the tire. It's, it's also called a sew-up because the, t the tire is sewn around the tube. So if you get a pinch flat or something, you have to chuck the whole thing and buy a brand new tire. So I had tremendously horrible luck and I would like always just get a pinch flat or a piece of glass or something. And those are like hundred dollar tires. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. <laughs> but if you're getting into the sport, I would not recommend getting tubular. I know they seem pro, but the technology's come a long way. Don't do it. But I was stuck on these. This was a, a good setup for me on race day. I would never think about training <laughs> with the tubulars, but for, um, for, for racing, it was just fine. Wow, another jersey change. So that <laughs> Folsom team also folded after one year. And I'm starting to think, Logan, maybe it's me. <laughs> maybe it's not these teams. Maybe I'm the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to Alto Velo, which is, which is WebCore. I referred to it as WebCore earlier. That's actually the sponsor. The, um, the club is Alto Velo. It was just me. Uh, there were no other people in the P12 field, so I know, had no teammates. I was kind of learning the hard way. Um, how to race, and I kind of just struggled. You probably Felt had like to the, learn how to save energy and not rely on other people. It, yeah, yeah, and I had to make the, the the right decision, right? If you go with the breakaway, it's not like you're setting up a teammate if you don't have teammates, right? So um, anyway, yeah. that's the way that went. Same setup, and then we get to 2015. Oh, Got you, by the way, if you saw that. Let me know in the comments. <laughs> Got you guys. Uh, this was Chico time trial. This is a stage race, and me just kind of rolling in to make the time cut in the time trial. But yeah, changed teams once again. Um, wanted to race with friends and with teammates, so uh, Tehran Elite is where it was. And this was actually before Tehran Elite. This was Squadra, but it's the same group of guys. You're and, supposed uh, to say that last picture was um, just after you blew the legs off everybody in the sprint, and you just yeah. had enough time to post up. Let me take that again. Okay, this was me uh, crossing. Yeah, this was me crossing the finish line first. That's a good point, Logan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now uh, that's the same setup that I had for for a number of years. What is that? Three years or so. And uh, and then here we are. Later that same year, I believe. Same jersey. Yeah, later that same year. So 2015. You'll notice a difference here in the uh, the wheels. These are not Eastons with the stickers peeled off. These are Chinese knockoff carbon which have been getting a lot of buzz on the internet these days what's your take on, on this logan I, I don't know if you've been looking at that so i definitely like wheels are something i look for just to find them cheap and i've learned that most carbon wheels are more expensive than my bike so <laughs> that would be kind of pointless and chinese yeah. carbon wheels have been like you know like a temptation but i can't it's always a hit or miss on whether you get good ones or from what i see yeah. or yours are going to break underneath you so I wanted to know what your take was on yeah, when yeah. you had dark carbon wheels. Turns out I have opinions. It's not like me to have a, an opinion on something. <laughs> so yeah, I, I've owned, in fact, I bought two sets of Chinese carbon wheels. And, and here's my take. Uh, they are significantly cheaper than, you know, your name brand stuff, your Reval, uh, your Bontrager, whatever it is. And it could work. It could not. I think it's a roll of the dice. So the reason why this name brand stuff is a lot more expensive is they put a lot of money behind marketing. Let's be honest. <laughs> There's a lot of money behind brick and mortar stores, behind marketing, behind brand design and all this other stuff. But with the Chinese carbon wheels, they don't market it the same way. And that's one of the reasons why they're a lot cheaper. But there's, there's a big consideration that I think a lot of people forget about. And that is uh, quality control. So, um, which can be terrifying if it's your wheels. <laughs> and I think these name brand, like I said before, you know, the Rovals and the Bontragers of the world, they have a much higher quality standard for their product. So um, I will just tell you guys my experience with the Chinese carbon stuff, because um, I've had a couple of wheels and they both failed. So that's a little bit scary. Um, neither of them resulted in me crashing. That's good. Uh, one of them, the braking track started to delam delaminate and guys inspect your equipment <laughs> so i noticed this before i went off the side of a cliff because that's that's what can happen with a delaminated carbon wheel um that's when the brake track can't handle the heat from braking and then this carbon starts to separate from uh the epoxy or the resin or whatever and it can be it can be catastrophic so i caught yeah. it before it was a big issue and i just trashed those wheels the other set which i think is the one you see in this photo here Eventually, the free hub body started making a really weird noise, and it wasn't spinning smooth, so I was just wasting watts for God knows how long I was rolling around with, you know, leaving watts on the table. That sucks. 
And, uh, and I took it apart and I cleaned it and I greased it and I serviced everything and the paws looked fine. But, um, I think it was a, it was a hub bearing issue and I wasn't going to take apart a hub bearing, you know, I was going to spend the time and money on a $300 product to begin with. So, uh, that, that's my experience with Chinese carpet. I know you guys are going to beg to differ, um, but, uh, that's my experience. You're I was on them for two, a couple of years. And it's probably better not to strike out. <laughs> uh, yeah. Strike out may mean going down. So <laughs> my third strike is bad news. Yeah. So so I wouldn't mess with it again. But if you're really cash strapped and you want to roll the dice, like maybe like <laughs> give it a shot. It's up to you. I I personally wouldn't do it anymore. Um. All right. So we fast forwarded now. Um. Nice glasses, Jeff. So all the now, glasses and this. I think they're my favorite part. Now we're 2016. I want to say 2016. Yep. So this is a. Uh, this is the same same team, Squadra Tayrun. Now we have the elite team, and I'm on a different bike. So we have a difference now. Same Chinese carbon wheels, different bike, and uh, still a felt. <clears throat> so I went from the felt F4 to the felt F1, and I didn't buy it. So what happened is, is felt recalled that that year. I think it was a 2010 or 2011 felt F4. They recalled it, and uh, they were replacing them. Mm-hmm with felt F1s. So lucky me, I upgraded for free. <laughs> and, uh, that's what I ended up racing on for 2016 for a very abbreviated period of time <laughs> because, uh, I oh, ended up no. having a, yeah. I don't know if you've seen this photo yet. I haven't. Right oh no. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was catastrophic. So I broke, um, I broke myself and I broke my bike at the same time. And this was a really bad crash in a crack in a race, fully snapped the front fork which you don't see too often when you hit something that hard that the, the whole fork snaps off. Also snapped my collarbone. I was so, going to um, ask what you broke. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Broke my collarbone. The bone isn't supposed to be in like eight pieces. So yeah, I was put back together um, with titanium and screws. So I'm, I'm a bionic man now. But uh, that, was the end of, that was the end of that season. <laughs> and um, that was the rebirth of the felt. I was like Dr. Frankenstein. I rebuilt her back to her original glory. Um, at the end of the 2017 season, I dedicated myself to to a lot of indoor workouts and a, and a lot of really uh, aerobic endurance based training. Everything is new on this bike. Like I wasn't kidding when I I called it the Frankenfelt for a reason, because new fork obviously. <laughs> We're looking at new bars, new seat posts, new saddle, new wheels, new crank set, everything basically. Let's just talk about the big stuff here though, the stuff that that makes the most difference. Um, the wheels. Let's start there. So. Yeah, I did away with the Chinese Carbon. Like I said, both of them failed. I was 0 for 2. And I went for Bontrager. They were a brand sponsor for my team, Tayrun Elite. I got the A-List Pro 5s, like you see in this picture. They are the Zip 404 equivalent. So they are just kind of your medium depth, you know, no frills, carbon wheel. They're tubeless ready. This is another thing that a lot of people ask me about. I've never even tried tubeless, you guys. So I'm not the right person to talk to about it. I just run tubes. I think if you do a lot of winter training and you ride on a lot of questionable roads, I think tubeless is a pretty attractive option. I've heard a lot of great things about it. A lot of my teammates ride it. So I, I, um, I can't personally endorse it, but I say go for it if you have the setup. I just run tubes because I'm lazy and I'm used to it. But, ooh, long-winded. Um, <laughs> let's talk more about yeah. this bike. Because I want to talk about the most important feature on this bike. And this is, like I said, late 2017, early 2018, power meter. I was a late adopter. And man, I wish I wasn't because this is the single biggest equipment change that I made that that improved my performance. Hands down, 95% of my success in 2018, 2019, and then that very short 2020 season is the result of structured training with power, with intent, and with focus. Better late than never, I guess. But for you guys listening to this... um, yeah, get get a power meter. That's why I have Logan on training with power and structure because otherwise you're flying blind. You don't know what you're doing. I thought you were going to say the most important piece for that seat post, to be honest. <laughs> I got a lot of comments about this, the silver seat post. The funny part about that is it's a Thompson seat post. They have gunmetal and they have silver or chrome or whatever they call that. They just didn't and have one. You wanted have... to be different. So, <laughs> no, actually, I didn't. I think it would look, probably them. looked better with, uh, w- with the gunmetal. It would have matched the frame better, but that's all they had in stock. I was like, whatever. It's, mm. you know, it's, uh, it's function over form for me. So, um, so the Frankenfelt was, was born. Uh, here it is with me on top of it in, in 2018. That was my breakout year. Best all around rider. I'll pat myself on the back a little bit. Structured training, though, it works, you guys. And that was my first year with power. Oh, here's a big change. What's this BH doing? <laughs> upgrade yeah yeah well kind of 
I just bought this. Um, I was contemplating even putting this photo in here, but um, you, I figured people would be asking about it because for the keen eyed out there, they will have seen this bike in, in some of the content I've produced. It is it is a purchase decision I made in 20, late 2018, 2019, I think, somewhere in there. I just got it for cheap from a friend who was trying to punt it for some money. I was commuting a lot to work and I was turning those into actually like legit training miles. I also wanted a rain bike. So this, this was... This was a multi-purpose bike. Um, it was my commuter bike. It was my ride in the rain bike. And then lastly, it was my race replacement bike. Like it was serving backup duty in case the felt was, which was getting a little long in the tooth. Let's not uh, kid ourselves. If the felt bit the dust, if I decided to lay her down again, guys, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous sport. Then I'd have a backup bike. And uh, that was kind of the idea behind the BH. These days it just lives on the trainer. So, which is funny because it, it was first purchased to be a rain bike and it's, it kind of still is my rain bike, just in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't see the rain now, I hope. Yeah, here's my, my indoor setup, by the way. You guys see, this is where I live stream from. My fan configuration is a bit different. I, I put a fan up on the um, the dryer there. <laughs> yeah, we mentioned that earlier. Um, everyone has their fan tendencies, like mine are more right and left, blowing on either side of me. In this picture, you had them both dead on and now you say you have one up on the dryer up there right fans for indoor workouts you guys are incredibly important and you might not even realize it. you might be like oh i'm working so hard i'm dripping sweat if you're not cooling yourself appropriately you're not getting performance benefits like it's just plain and simple so anyway these lasco fans are great so i keep them at, th at three maximum power all the time because um i yeah it's it's really it's important. gonna be cold starting off though yeah so that's why i layer up I got to layer up and then slowly start to peel the layers back as you get into the workouts. Okay. Uh, we're reaching the end here. I promise you guys. We are now, I'm doing the math, uh, 29, late 2019. The, the YouTube channel had started to get a little following. Thank you guys. What happened was I made a video about the Frankenfeld and felt must have seen that. They reached out. They're like, hey, you want to check out one of our new models? This replaces the super old model that you have. And uh, I was like, okay, twist my arm. <laughs> so uh, I ended up with this um, Felt FR. A great bike. I did a review on it on the channel if you guys want to check it out. I talk a lot more in detail about it. It is like the master of none, I think is the way I described it. If you could only have one bike, um, this is a pretty good pretty good uh, selection here. You can run fat tires on it. It's not going to be the lightest. It's not going to be the most aero. It's not the cheapest. It's not the most expensive. It's just like you're down the middle road bike. <laughs> like that's the way I described it. And a uh, very capable bike. And I swapped out all the components. I got it fit. I cut the steer. I did all this stuff. And I was like, sweet, I have a new race bike for 2020. And then Mike's Bikes called me. And they're like, hey, congratulations on having a successful 2018 and 2019. Would you like to race with us? <laughs> and I was like, I can't pass that opportunity up. So um, I joined Mike's um, mm. in, in 2020. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a pretty bike, isn't it? Oh, it's my favorite. I am a Venge fanboy. And I have been from outside of the cycling world. I love the way those look. Yeah, let's just take a moment to appreciate the glory. My goodness. There is something about the aesthetic of the Venge. Like, there is no denying mm. that is a pretty looking bike. This is the Venge Pro, and uh, this is the t this was the team bike from 2020. I get asked this a lot, so I'll be clear on uh, right now on the channel for all you guys. This bike did not belong to me. It belonged to the team. So I used it for the year, and then I sold it, and that money goes to the team. I was lucky enough to race on it for, for 2020, and I gave the felt back to felt. I didn't own that bike either. The previous felt that you saw frankenfelt is still mine my my brother-in-law has it he's enjoying it now but yeah this, the the venge was this is a, a just a, an absolute joy to ride it is incredibly stiff you guys not, i wouldn't say it's as shocking of a difference as going from my 600 hundred dollar bike to my you know several thousand dollar felt full carbon that's probably the that's probably the biggest difference but this is a, an ex, an extremely stiff bike it's great for crits. It's basically tailor-made for crits, and I miss this bike. This is, a, this is a good bike. I was I was sad to see the Venge line die last year, but that leads us into what happened uh, earlier this year, I guess last year now. Mid-2020, mid was able to, uh, to get on the SL7, which is my final form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, you know, on paper, it is le a slightly less aerodynamic than the Venge. I thought it was more. I thought it was more arrow. No, I think the Venge on paper uh, is more arrow, but that doesn't mean it's faster because the the SL7 is almost as arrow, but it is a couple pounds lighter. So it is. I think it's overall a a faster bike. But look, we're at the point where it's like we're 
we're talking we're talking about these theoretical numbers Only people on a like you see these differences you put me on either one of those i get smoked <laughs> no i'm not even claiming i i know the differences i look at the spec sheet i'm like cool this bike's faster awesome they both feel great the sl7 and the venge both felt like phenomenal race bikes let's just rewind back 11 years before this picture was taken and look at the 600 hundred dollar bike that got me into cat too like guys if especially if you're just new to the sport it is so much more about these other things and that's the reason why Logan's on a base model LA because it is more than capable of getting you to a really high level in the sport. And you really only see these differences in really high end equipment when you've exhausted all other opportunities. The low hanging fruit is gone, right? You're that's when your training is just on point and you can't lose any more weight. And let's be honest, everybody could lose a little bit more weight, right? <laughs> and when, you know, your, your nutrition isn't, uh, is dialed on the bike. If you have everything just absolutely dialed, that's when you start to look at these differences of one or two percentage points in equipment, that's when it starts to look really attractive. Hopefully I'm describing that well, because that's, that's my take on all this stuff. There's no reason you can't cat up on your, um, your sub $1,000, even your, your sub $750 bike. That was, that was long winded. Thanks for hanging in there, Logan. <laughs> We're good. We're good. So, we, it's, it's bikes. I could talk bikes all day. I know me too. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm a total bike dork. I guess if you're come this far in the video, you probably realize that you must be a bike dork too. <laughs> So uh, let's just recap real fast because, guys, is, like I said, this is an expensive sport and I want you to spend your money in the smartest way possible. So if I could take myself in a time machine and go back and give young Jeff some good non -goatee tips. Non-goatee Jeff. <laughs> Non-goatee Jeff some tips. Here's what I'd tell him. And here's, what I'd, here's my advice to you guys and my advice to, to Logan. Don't think so much about the equipment. Think about the stuff that is going to get you more results in terms of performance. And that is a power meter. There is no excuses not to have a power meter these days. I was faced with this $2,000 decision. SRM was like the only choice back when I started. You can get a $250 single-sided power meter now. I'll put a link in the description for you guys. Um, you'll get another 15% off um, because the guys at Stages are super generous. There's this whole other aspect. And I want to touch on this too, which is like new gear is awesome. <laughs> like I'm a total bike dork. I love new gear. And for me, there are like the two most motivational things to get out there and do hard intervals and train is results, right? If you just want to race, like you want to keep, keep after it and like win the next race and a new piece of gear. Look guys, I get it. Go buy the expensive toy. And like, this is fun. First and foremost, we're doing this for fun. So buy the bike. That's going to make you motivated to go out and ride your bike. Whew, thanks for hanging in there. It's been, it's been fun. That was awesome. All right, so if you like this video, click like, and uh, don't forget to subscribe. Logan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Jeff, uh, anytime. We'll see you in the next one. See you.